Hello and welcome to lecture 3 for the course ECE 254B uh, Parallel Processing. Um, in this lecture I, I will cover chapters 3 and 4 uh, in the textbook uh, with more of the time spent on chapter 3 which provides us with the tools uh, to analyze uh, the complexity of parallel algorithms and, in fact, algorithms more generally. And so, uh, in this chapter, we review notions of algorithm complexity and various complexity classes, uh, introduce the notions of time and time cost optimality, and derive tools for analysis, comparison, and fine-tuning of algorithms in parallel applications more generally. Okay, the first uh, item to be discussed uh, is the notion uh, of big O. O notation. You are, you are likely familiar with this uh, notation from other courses. When we say some function f of n is big O of some other function g of n, what we mean is that f of n, so each of these functions has a growth rate, it grows, uh, f of n grows in such a way that it will always stay below, but beyond a certain point, it will always stay below some constant times g of n. So constants in this type of asymptotic complexity analysis are ignored. So for example, from complexity, asymptotic complexity point of view, 2n squared, 3n squared, and 5n squared, they're all the same. They're order n squared. Okay, so if f of n grows in such a way that beyond a certain point, beyond some n0, f of n always stays below some constant times g of n, then we say f of n is O of g of n. And this is interpreted as the rate of growth of f of n is upper bounded by the rate of growth of g of n. In other words, it doesn't it grows at most as fast as g of n, but not faster. Okay, so for example, a function 3n log n, that's f of n, is big O of n squared. In other words, n squared eventually grows faster than 3n times log n beyond a certain uh, value of n, some constant value of n. Okay, so this is the part that you probably already knew. We also have the corresponding uh, lower bound. So this is upper bound. Corresponding lower bound notation, big omega. We say f of n is big omega of g of n if eventually f of n beyond a certain point grows faster than some constant times g of n. Again, constants are ignored, so f of n basically grows, rate of growth of f of n is greater than or equal to the rate of growth of g of n. So for example, 1 half n log squared n is omega n equals omega n, meaning that this is a lower bound for the rate of growth. The, the rate of growth of n is a lower bound for the rate of growth of n log squared n. As I mentioned, the constants are ignored in this type of asymptotic analysis. And finally, the third notation on this slide is big theta. We say f of n is big theta of g of n if f of n is big O of g of n and f of n is big omega of g of n. In other words, both of these conditions are satisfied. In this case, the rate of growth of f of n is exactly the same as the rate of growth of g of n. 
So here you see f of n is growing such that it is always above some constant c times g of n and always below some constant c prime times g of n. Okay, so we can find these two constants c and c prime so that f of n always stays between the two. In other words, it doesn't grow any faster than g of n. It doesn't grow any slower than g of n. So the rate of growth is exactly the same. So for example, 3n squared plus 200n is theta of n squared. Okay, the rate of growth here is quadratic. The rate of growth here is also quadratic, although the constants are different. Now, this uh, notation big O, big omega, and big theta are complemented by notation little o and little omega. And here I've shown an analogy. A big O is the equivalent of less than or equal when we compare numbers. Okay, So the rate of growth of f of n is less than or equal to the rate of growth of g of n. Um, big omega means greater than or equal to. Rate of growth of f of n is greater than or equal to rate of growth of g of n. And theta means the rates of growth are equal. And here I have examples that you can see on your own. Now, little o means the rate of growth of f of n is strictly less than the rate of growth of g of n. And this little o you may have seen used when we uh, write the series expansion of some function. And that series expansion, uh, we write a few terms. And then we say plus little o of some uh, function, meaning that all the remaining terms that we are ignoring are less significant in terms of the growth rate than what we are including in that parenthesis. Okay, so little o is strictly less than, big O is less than or equal, so equality is possible here. Similarly, little omega is strictly greater than. Okay, so that's the counterpart of little o what little o is to big O, little omega is to big omega. So these are these notations of these throughout this course, we use big O quite a lot. Uh, we use theta uh, probably next most frequently, and then big omega. The other two we seldom use. But for completeness, I've included all of them. In this slide. Okay, so here are some typical functions that we encounter when we analyze the rate of growth of, say, running time for an algorithm. Uh, let's say order log squared n. We have quite a few algorithms that we'll see that run in order log squared n, square root of n, n linear time, n log squared n, n square root of n, okay? So here for n going from 10 to 1 million, I've evaluated these functions. And uh, you see, for example, that log squared n does not grow very fast. It's only 361 when we get to 1 million. Square root of n grows faster, okay? And uh, n log squared n, of course, grows even faster. And n square root of n. So square root of n basically grows faster than log squared n, eventually. And you see here, this, this is a faster growing function. But for smaller values of n, it has values that are smaller than n log squared n. So this is the sense in which we deal with asymptotic complexity. For large enough n, this is a faster growing function. And square root of n is a faster growing function than n log squared n, even though for small n, okay, this function has smaller values. 
Okay, you see, for example, that beginning in this table, beginning with n equal to 100,000, uh, this one becomes larger. And here I've shown the effect of constant. So again, n ranges from 10 to 1 million. This is n over 4 log squared n. This is n log squared n. So this is basically one fourth of this. It has a different constant in front of it. Uh, and you see that. Uh, and then the, the times, instead of being stated in units of second, let's say, uh, they're converted to more familiar uh, units so that you can see the growth. So n over 4 log squared n, if the running time is uh, n over 4 log squared n for n equal to 10, we have, let's say, 20 second running time. n equal 100, we have 15 minutes. Okay, n equal to 1,000, we have six hours, and then it gets to three years. At this point, it becomes an algorithm, but this complexity would be pretty much impractical for n equal 1 million because the running time will be three years. n log squared n becomes impractical even earlier as the size grows. 100 square root of n basically remains practical even one day one might say is a practical running time depending on the application and then n square root of n okay so here it was practical even though a large constant was involved in this case the constant is one in front of it but pretty soon as n grows it becomes impractical eventually reaching 32 years for 1 million, an input of size 1 million, okay? So we have names for these types of growth rates, the ones in particular that we encounter more often. A growth rate O1 means uh, the running time is constant regardless of prob problem size. And such cases we rarely encounter in practice. Intuitively, you know, as the problem size grows, the running time must grow. So any reasonable assumptions about uh, uh, the hardware available to us, uh, communication and so on, it's unlikely that we get a constant running time uh, regardless of the problem size. But we do have the notation for it if needed, O1. O log log n, this is a very slowly growing function. It's called double logarithmic growth rate. It is an instance of a sub-logarithmic growth rate. The next one in this ladder is logarithmic growth rate, which is still pretty good because log of n for n equal to 1 million, if we take log base 2, log of n is only 20. So that's a manageable growth rate. Polylogarithmic is the name given to a polynomial in logarithm of n. And then in the case of polynomial, we only write the largest, uh, uh, the, the term with the largest exponent. So log k, this is a polynomial of degree k. Because the other one, the smaller exponents will be dominated by this larger exponent. This is known as polylogarithmic. K, of course, is assumed to be a constant. Uh, then we have growth rate n to the power a, where a is less than 1. So, for example, a equal to 1 half, this will be square root of n. And no matter how small a is, this function eventually grows faster than this function, no matter how large k is, okay? So log a cube of k, k equal to 3, is a slower growing function eventually than n to the power 0.1 even. Okay, so the ordering here means that this is a faster growing function 
regardless of how small a is. And then n divided by some power of log n, this is still sublinear. Linear is n, basically. So anything that is less than n, like this one, is sublinear. Of course, n over 2, we don't consider sublinear because it's still linear. So asymptotically, remember that we discount uh, constants. So this is a sublinear function because n is divided by some non-constant function. And above linear, we have n log to the k of n as an example. This is an example of a superlinear growth rate. n to some power where that power is greater than 1. This is known as polynomial growth rate. So this can be n squared, can be n cubed. It can be n to the power 1.1, okay? That's still polynomial. So n to the power 1 plus epsilon, no matter how small epsilon is, is still super linear. Uh, 2 to the n, uh, 2 to the n is exponential growth rate. And this is something that we try to avoid because once the growth rate is exponential, even for moderate values of n, the running time becomes unmanageable. So any algorithm that has exponential running time will be uh, basically useful only for small problem sizes. And of course, even worse than exponential is this double exponential running time, which is basically a death sentence for an algorithm. If the running time is 2 to the power 2 to the power n, then even n equal to 10 would lead to an unacceptable running time. OK, so this is just a matter of terminology. We have sublinear functions, we have linear, which is order n, and then superlinear, and several examples of superlinear are given here, uh, of which exponential and double exponential are really impractical, because you can't solve large problems if the running time is exponential or above exponential. OK, now as we develop algorithms, uh, the typical course of research is that some algorithm is developed for a problem. And over time, people improve the running time of that algorithm. And that improvement can be of uh, basically two, two types. One is minor improvements, basically cutting the constant in front of the running time. So for example, if the running time is uh, 5n squared, and then we reduce it to 2n squared, and we have made the algorithm more efficient, that's minor because the order is still n squared. However, if we have an algorithm that runs in order n squared time, let's say in 1982, and developed an algorithm whose running time was order n squared, and in 1988, a few years later, BERT developed a faster algorithm, order n log n, asymptotically faster than that algorithm. So this is an improvement. Then perhaps in 1991, Chin developed an order n log log n. So this factor log n was replaced by this double logarithmic function. So this is even faster. And these cartoons basically show that you know the speed is improved. And then in 1996, Dana developed an even better algorithm, but this log log n disappeared, so the running time is linear. That still may not be the best algorithm, but it's the best so far up to 1996. That's the best algorithm we know. Now, when this algorithm is developed, it doesn't sometimes doesn't make all the older algorithms obsolete because remember constants do matter. So if this order n algorithm has a constant 20 in front of it, 20n, versus a constant uh, let's say 2 over here, 
then for many values of n, this algorithm will still be faster. Okay, so we keep those algorithms around because in some cases they may actually be faster. Okay, simultaneously, so these are basically this big O, remember, is upper bound. As we reduce the upper bound, okay, we are getting closer and closer to the optimal. We don't know where the optimal lies, but we know that the optimal is not worse than order n because we already have an algorithm that runs in order n time. Okay, so this is an upper bound. We can also uh, study our problems and algorithms theoretically and establish lower bounds. And we'll see examples of these lower bounds throughout the course. So for example, for that same problem in 1988, Zach established theoretically that you cannot develop an algorithm that runs faster than log n for this problem. So this problem is an omega log n problem, meaning that its complexity is lower bounded by log n. This basically establishes a wall in this cartoon characterization, meaning that as we move to the left, we can never go beyond this wall. Okay, that's the notion of lower bound. Then just as the upper bound can be improved by developing faster and faster algorithms, the lower bounds can be improved by establishing what we call tighter bounds. So a few years later after Zach, Ying develops the lower bound, proves the lower bound omega log square then, meaning that uses some property, uh, properties of the problem to show that no algorithm can possibly solve it in a lower, a smaller learning time that, than order log square then. This builds another wall. And now the problem is, where is the optimal algorithm? We know it can't be beyond this wall. We know that it's not to the right of this bar. Uh, is the optimal n divided by log n? That's a possible point. Is the optimal log square then? Because we sometimes uh, develop algorithms that match a proven lower bound in terms of complexity, at which point we know that no further improvement is possible, at least not substantially, because uh, we can still improve the constants, as I mentioned uh, before, but not fundamentally faster. Okay, on this slide, I'm not going to go through it in detail. Two particular problems, the history of two particular problems are given in terms of improved bounds. For example, uh, the complexity of determining, determining whether an n-vertex graph is planar. It was known in uh, 1930 that an exponential algorithm for it was known. Of course, an exponential algorithm is not very useful for large graphs. Then in 1961, Auslander and Porter showed that this there's a, an order n cube algorithm for this, and so on. The, the other order n cube algorithms that were developed, so these are listed here because they were in, developed perhaps independently without knowledge of this one, or they improved on the constant factor in front of this uh, order n cube. Then order n squared, then n log n, then order n. So for this particular problem, the best asymptotic algorithm, the best algorithm in terms of asymptotic complexity is order n by Hopcroft and Pargen and also by Booth and Luker. Okay, this is another problem for a graph of n vertices and e edges. It's a little bit more complicated because two parameters are involved. So the first in the sequence is order n e squared. The second one is n squared e. Okay, so why is n squared e better than n e squared? Because a graph with n vertices has more than 
e more than n edges if the graph is connected it will have at least e edges or i should say e minus one edges so e is of a larger order generally than n so e squared being replaced by n times e is an improvement okay and this algorithm goes through many improvement steps until it gets to this weird complex expression that is you know the best known algorithm uh, for the max network flow algorithm uh, max network flow flow problem Okay, we call an algorithm time optimal, or just optimal for short, if the running time of the algorithm with n, uh, an input of size n, with d processor is equal to d of np, where gmp is an established lower bound. So if you have established a lower bound that this algorithm cannot run faster than what this function indicates and if we match that in terms of asymptotic complexity then we have reached an optimal or time optimal algorithm a cost time optimality takes cost into account too cost is basically how many processors we use in this solution how much hardware we apply to solve the problem and if p times the running time of the algorithm with p processors is equal to the running time of the algorithm with one processor this means that the redundancy and utilization are equal to one if you go back to the, the definition of redundancy and utilization you see that this condition implies that redundancy and utilization are equal to one Okay, uh, if we can't quite achieve this because parallel algorithms typically have some amount of redundancy. As long as that amount of redundancy is not excessive, we say that the algorithm is cost time efficient. Okay, efficiency means that P times TMP is not quite equal to TN1, but if it's of the same order of growth as this. So for example, if P times NP is two times TN1, then we are satisfied because redundancy and utilization are uh, constants, okay? They don't suffer much as the problem size grows. And one a cautionary note here is that we often evaluate algorithm complexity in this course and in many algorithm uh, courses al study of algorithm in terms of steps where we define steps so for example if you're doing a whole bunch of uh, you know if our application is arithmetic in intensive we may count the number of arithmetic operations how many addition multiplications division and we sometimes ignore the distinction between addition multiplication and division because these are these may have different speeds on different computers. But in the first order analysis, simple analysis, we ignore often those minor distinctions and say this algorithm requires this many steps, even though those steps are sometimes ill-defined and may have varying uh, uh, time requirements to perform. So this cautionary tale is uh, reflected in this cartoon Say, so, okay, here's a machine, an algorithm A, that takes four steps to get to the solution. This is a machine or algorithm B that takes 20 steps. In terms of steps, of course, this has five times as many steps as that one. But in order to really evaluate the quality of these two algorithms, we need to know something about how long these steps take, because it may well be that if this machine takes more than five steps in the time required for this one to take five uh, to take a single step then this algorithm may be faster okay so always bear 
in the back of your mind that evaluating algorithm, counting the number of steps, okay, has this pitfall that if you don't, if you're not careful about what kind of steps you use, that may not be uh, an accurate indication of the time complexity of the algorithm. Okay, so we try to, when we compare steps in algorithm execution, we try to make sure that those steps are pretty much uniform across the different algorithms and different machines so that it makes sense to compare algorithms in terms of the number of steps. Okay, this is a diagram that you see in the textbook. Uh, in the slides, I prefer to use this more modern, newer version of the same set of concepts. Okay, so this is the complexity space. Shows various classes of uh, algorithms with regard to or problems with regard to their complexity i won't describe all of these in detail and we don't really need to know all of them but some distinctions are useful first of all we have the class of e algorithms these are polynomial time problems that for which we can solve solve them using polynomial time algorithms. Polynomial is basically n to some power. So order n squared is polynomial, order n cubed is polynomial. Of course, the, the lower power of the polynomial correspond to more practical solutions. So for example, p to the 10 is still polynomial, but n to the 10 is still polynomial complexity, but the time grows very quickly with n. But still, compared with exponential complexity, even n to the 10 is still either manageable right now, or it will become manageable as we build faster and faster computers. Okay, so our goal is to develop solutions for problems that fall into this polynomial class. Okay, the non-polynomial class, which is this area, non-deterministic polynomial, these are problems for which we do not have a polynomial algorithm yet. However, we have a polynomial algorithm to verify a solution if someone gives us the solution. Okay? So if we could generate all the solutions non-deterministically and evaluate them one by one uh, using this polynomial uh, verification algorithm, then we can reach, we can verify that the, the particular claimed solution uh, is in fact correct. Okay, the thing is in computer science, we don't know, even though we, there are many algorithms that are NP currently, and we don't have polynomial algorithms for them, any problems, I should say. And we don't have polynomial algorithm for them. We don't know, it has not been established whether these two classes are actually distinct. It is possible that P and NP are really the same set of problems. Although increasingly, you know, research has shown and uh, researchers believe that these two are in fact distinct classes. So if we have an algorithm that runs in exponential time as an NP class, that may just be an indication that we have not tried hard enough, we were not smart enough to find a polynomial solution. So for now, it has exponential time. Okay, and we also have co-MP, which I'm going to ignore, and then P space another. Okay, so I've drawn the diagram in full to, to, so that you, you have an idea that there are other classes of complex. So for now, we focus on NP and P. NP are a set of problems that for now, we don't know how to solve them 
in polynomial time, they admit exponential time algorithms. Okay, some subset of problems in MP are known as MP complete. These are sort of distinguished problems so that any problem in MP can be converted to one of those problems, any one of those problems. And there are quite a few of these over the years. People have proved various things to be MP complete. So there are many examples in this space, MP complete space. And any one of those problems can be used to solve any other MP problem. So if you give me this MP problem, I can convert it to this MP complete problem. And if this, I have a solution for that MP complete problem, this one becomes solved too. So if ever somebody comes up with, an, uh, with a polynomial time algorithm for one, only one of these MP complete problems here, and the entire class of MP becomes polynomial, and it is proven that P is equal to MP. Okay, so this distinction collapses. If one of these MP complete problems is ever solved in polynomial time, and nobody has been able to do it, and because so many people have tried and so much time has been spent on it, the uh, general belief is that the we can't ever solve any of those MP-complete problems in polynomial time, okay? Similarly, within the class of P, which are, we call the tractable problems, there is a class called P-complete. Okay, the class P, uh, Let me go here. A subset of this class P is called the class NC. These are efficiently parallelizable problems. In other words, we can develop parallel solutions. So the, the running time of such problem is polynomial, maybe N squared, okay? If we can reduce the running time through parallel processing to a polylogarithmic time, so from n squared, for example, to log cube of n, and any power of log, okay? Then we say that we have efficiently parallelized it. In other words, the running time on a parallel machine is substantially less than the original running time on a single processor machine. This is known as NIC class, and NIC stands for Nicholas Pippinger, one of the pioneers of uh, the study of computational complexity, and his friends actually named this class after him. So NIC's class constitutes the class of efficiently parallelizable problems so that the running time can be reduced from polynomial to polylogarithmic. Again, it is uh, quite strange that we don't know whether the class NC is distinct from P. So just as P equal to MP question is unresolved, uh, P equal to NC problem is also unresolved. In other words, we don't know whether there are problems that cannot be efficiently parallelized. For now, we assume that there are such problems. And all indications are that probably these two classes are distinct. So there are problems that we cannot efficiently parallelize for now and maybe forever, okay? Now, P-complete problems have the same role that MP-complete problems had for MP. In other words, any P problems any P problem can be converted to a P complete problem so that if anyone ever parallelizes efficiently one of these P complete problems and shows that that P complete problem is, is an NC, then again these two classes collapse and we have proven that P is equal to NC. Okay, 
So the goal of parallelizing a computation is to reduce its complexity from polynomial time to polylogarithmic time. Exponential, of course, even if we parallelize a problem that has exponential time, it isn't of much help. You know, if, if the running time is 2 to the n, and you use a thousand processors, of course, you can go to relatively higher n values, but not much higher, okay? Because the exponential growth is so fast that it sort of overwhelms the thousand or even a million processors that we are using. So parallelization, parallel processing is useful for problems that are in this P class. And then we take them into the polylogarithmic running time class. So these are some MP complete problems. Uh, there are ma very many of these. These are probably the most famous ones. Uh, I'll just uh, describe a couple of these, okay? A subset sum problem, given a set of n integers and a target sum s, determine if a subset of the integers adds up to s. So I give you a set of integers. It's important that there be both positive and negative because with only positive integers, the problem is much simpler. Okay, if you have a given set of n integers and a target sum s, determine if a subset of the integers adds up to s. Okay, of course, a naive solution is just consider all the subsets. If you have n integers, there are 2 to the power n subsets. And if you consider each subset in turn and find the sum and then compare to s, you have solved the problem, but that requires exponential running time. So this problem being MP-complete means that we essentially have no option that is significantly better than that exponential option. We can optimize a little bit, do some you know, smart, tricky things to reduce the number of cases that we try. But fundamentally, we can't do much better than that exponential time. Okay? Let me also describe the last in the sequence, the traveling salesperson problem. Find the lowest cost or shortest tour of a number of cities given travel costs or distances. So we have a graph, basically. Nodes represent cities, and directed edges with weights represent travel cost between cities or travel distance. And then we want a salesperson to visit all of these cities, starting from city A, let's say, to go through visit all of those cities to make sales in those cities and return back to the home city having visited all of the cities uh, using either the shortest distance if the weights are distances or lowest cost if the weights are let's say airfare between those two cities between pairs of cities okay this problem again is mp complete because there are just too many paths, alternative paths to try and try to figure out which one leads to the lowest cost or shortest distance. Okay, one of the most useful paradigms in parallel processing is this first one, divide and conquer. And divide and conquer paradigm, we decompose a problem of size n into smaller problems. We solve subproblems independently. So that's where parallel processing comes into play. And then combine subproblem results into the final answer. So the solution time consists of the some time spent on decomposing the problem, sometimes some time spent at the end combining the subproblem results. And then the bulk of the time, hopefully, hopefully these overheads are small, the bulk of the time is spent in solving those problems in parallel, and therefore that leads to speed up. Okay, an example for sorting is if you want to sort 
a list of size n, and let's say you have two processors. Divide the list into two sublists of equal sizes, then have the two processors each solve one of those, sort one of the halves of the list. So you did do the decomposition, which is trivial, basically assign the first half of the list to one processor, the second half to the other processor. And then when the two processors have sorted their respective sublists, then you have to merge. Now this merge is non-trivial, but it's a simpler problem merging than sorting. Therefore, uh, the bulk of the time will be spent here. So this is the divide and conquer paradigm. The randomization is another paradigm that we find useful. Uh, when it's impossible or difficult to decompose a large problem into subproblems with equal solution times, we settle for roughly equal solution times rather than exactly equal. Because if we aim for exactly equal subproblems, this decomposition may be more difficult. Okay, so that's an example of randomization. And finally, approximation is when we um, the finding exact solution to a problem is computationally difficult. We may aim uh, for finding approximate solution, something that is close to optimal, uh, hopefully, you know, provably close, say within a factor of 1.5 of the optimal, something like that. And then that approximation will be used as a substitute for the exact optimal solution. Okay, the last uh, section of this chapter deals with solving recurrences, which is a very useful tool uh, in analyzing algorithms. Okay, so the first recurrence, I'll go through a number of these. Um, so that you get the flavor for how, how to deal with these. f of n equal to f of n minus 1 plus n. Basically, you're faced with a problem of size n, you want to solve it. If you convert that to the solution of a problem of size n minus 1, and then you spend n steps in that conversion, then this will be the recurrence that determines the running time of the algorithm. Okay, so this uh, can be, this is exemplified by uh, selection sort, for example. You want to sort n items, you scan the list, which requires n steps, to find the largest element in the list. Put that at the end of the sorted list, the largest element, so you've already spent n steps, and then you now have to solve the sorting problem for the remaining n minus 1. Okay, a useful method for solving such recurrences, in other words, I'm trying to determine what f of n is, given that f of n is related to f of n minus 1. Uh, a technique called unrolling can be used, because I say f of n minus 1, using the same equation, the same recurrence, is f of n minus 2, plus n minus 1, because remember, n has been replaced by n minus 1. So this becomes f of 1 less than n minus 1, plus n minus 1. And then this in turn is f of n minus 3, plus n minus 2. And then as I unroll, I get n, n minus 1, n minus 2, all the way down to 2. And then here I have f of 1. If I assume that f of 1, sorting a list of size 1, takes 0 time, I don't have to do anything to sort the list of size 1, then the sum of these numbers, n times n plus 1 over 2 minus 1, it's of order n squared. So this sorting algorithm is an order n squared. Selection sort is an order n squared sorting algorithm. Of course, no parallel processing is involved. This is just a regular sequential algorithm. OK, this is another recurrence. f of n equal f of n over 2 plus 1. Um, this recurrence arises, for example, in binary sort. By binary search, sorry, binary search. 
So if you want to search a list of size n, which is sorted, okay, if their numbers are sorted from small to large, if it's a list of names and it's sorted alphabetically. So you go to the middle of the list and examine that one element there. You either find what you're looking for, in which case you are done, or more likely you determine whether what you are seeking is in the first half of the list before this middle element that you examine or after the middle element, in which case your problem size is reduced to n over 2. Again, unrolling says uh, leads to f of n over 2 is f of n over 4 plus 1, f of n over 4 is f of n over 8 plus 1, and then eventually you get f of n over n. And this unrolling results in log 2 n terms of 1. So this is order log n. So binary search as an algorithm has a running time order log n. Okay, I'll go through other examples more quickly. Uh, all of these are done through unrolling. F of n is equal to f of n over 2 plus 1. Solution would be order n. I'll leave it up to you to try to come up with examples of algorithms that exhibit that uh, basically are characterized by that recurrence. F of n is equal to f of n over 2 plus n. Again, you divide the problem. You reduce the problem to half the size by spending this much time in decomposing the problem and also at the end to use the result of the subproblem to find the result of the original problem. Okay, again unrolling leads to order n running time. Sometimes guessing can be used so for example, let's say you look at this and say, oh, I think the solution to this is theta n. Okay? So theta n means some constant times n plus g of n, where g of n is of lower order than n. Okay? So it may be square root of n or log of n, anything that is lower than n. So if this guess is correct, it has to basically satisfy the original recurrence. So f of n, which is cn plus g of n, must be f of n over 2, c, of, c times n over 2 plus g of n over 2 plus n. So this equation must be satisfied. Okay, now because g of n, g of n over 2, those are lower order functions. Okay, so I have cn is equal to cn over 2 plus n. This leads to c equal to 2. So I determine that leading constant term, c equal to 2. And then g of n equal to g of n over 2. Okay, which basically means g of n must be a constant because it doesn't change when n changes. So through this guessing method, I'm able to find this solution. Uh, without actually going through the unrolling process. Of course, provided that um, I have a basis for guessing the solution. All right, uh, still more examples. Uh, f of n is 2 f of n over 2 plus n. Uh, now this one, when you unroll, you get n terms uh, of which there are log 2n. So this is n log n. And this is exemplified by sorting. To sort the list of size n, you sort uh, its two halves. So there's no parallel processing involved. The two halves must be sorted one at a time. So that's why we take twice as much time. Plus n, and that's the merge time. Okay, order n is the merge time, and this leads to order n log n uh, sorting algorithm. This is the same recurrence except uh, the same problem, 
except that the two subproblems are assumed to be solved in parallel. And then the merge time is assumed to be log to n instead of n. We'll see you know, instances of algorithms that exhibit this behavior. And then when you unroll this, this is probably the most complicated one in the unrolling process. You get something like log two in base two, log four in base two, and so on. And this will be order log squared n. Okay, there's this master theorem for recurrences that allows us to write the, the asymptotic solution for recurrences directly when the conditions of the theorem are satisfied. So we don't have to do the uh, difficult work of unrolling, which is sometimes error prone. We make a mistake in the middle and we get the wrong result. So this theorem says, given the recurrence f of n equal to a times f of n over b plus h of n, a and b are constants, and h is some arbitrary function. Okay, so for example, in the previous, this is h of n in this example. This is h of n, some function that you put there. So this is quite general, h of n. Now this says basically I divide the problem of size n by dividing it into b pieces. So each problem is now each subproblem is of size n over b. However, I can't solve all of those subproblems at once. I need a times. I need to repeat the solution a times. So, for example, if a is equal to b, this is like dividing n by two and then using twice as much time because the two sublists are. Uh, solve the uh, one at a time. Okay, if a is equal to one, means basically all of the subproblems are solved at once, so the time complexity for only one of them is taken into account. So this is sort of a more general thing. So sometimes we divide the problem into subproblems, let's say 10 subproblems, but we need four passes, for example, or two passes. To solve all of those subproblems, and we'll see examples of this. Okay, this is the case. The asymptotic solution to the recurrence is as follows: c is log of a in base b, log of a in base b. So if a and b are equal, and c is equal to one. Okay. If a is equal to 1, okay, then log of 1 in base b is 0. In other cases, is a number between 0 and 1. So c is a number between 0 and 1. Uh, let me see. Did I state that correctly? Log of a in base b. So if f of n is theta n to the power c, remember c is a constant because a and b are constant. If it so happens that f of n is theta n of c, n to the power c, uh, sorry, the solution is f of n theta n to the c if this condition is satisfied. So condition is on the right. This is the solution under this condition. What is the condition? If h of n, if the function that appears here, is O of is upper bounded by n to the power c minus epsilon. And epsilon is any small number. In other words, it should be less than n to the power c, the rate of growth. Even a tiny bit less than would be okay, but it cannot be equal to n to the c. 
So for any epsilon greater than zero, no matter how small. The solution is uh, data of n to the power c log n if h of n is exactly beta n to the c, if at the exactly same order of growth as n to the power c, and uh, f of n is theta h of n, h of n is omega, is lower bounded by n to the power c plus epsilon. In other words, h of n is, grows a little bit faster than n to the power c. Again, no matter how small epsilon is, this condition is sufficient for the solution to be. So there are three cases of solution. One is n to the power c, some polynomial, because c is a constant. This is polynomial time. It's of the order h of n, this function, whatever it happens to be in this case, it's of the order n to the power c log of n, in this third case. Okay, so here's an example that I let you study that applies this master theorem to the solution of this recurrence that we saw before, and it finds the same solution for it. So when you encounter it with a recurrence, the first thing we do is to see whether this master theorem is applicable and use it if it is. Otherwise, we try to find another way of solving the recurrence. Okay, uh, this is the intuition behind the master theorem. I let you study this uh, intuition, explanation of this intuition on your own. All right, uh, the rest of my time I'm gonna spend uh, reviewing pretty quickly some of the concepts in chapter four of the textbook entitled Models of Parallel Processing. Now, one of the earliest types of parallel processing is what we called in those days, in fact, this is how I gained my entry into the field of parallel processing for my PhD work uh, many years ago uh, in the early 1970s. Uh, I was working on this notion of associative memory. So what is associative memory? It's also known as content addressable memory. Now, a normal memory, standard memory, random access memory that we deal with in computers, as the name implies, it's random access. You put data at each data item at a certain location, and then you remember what that location is. And then when you want to retrieve that data, you go to that location, provide the address, and say, fetch contents of memory location, and so and so. So that's random access memory. Okay, if you have a list of values or names that are sorted alphabetically, you use something like binary search. Again, you say, okay, go to the middle of the list, that's a specific location, examine the entry there, and then based on the, the outcome of that comparison, uh, either focus on the first half of the list. Or not. So basically location plays the main role, the key role in accessing data. In content addressable memory, we really don't have the location information. We don't even care about location. So data is stored, let's say, take an example where uh, student perm numbers and names are stored in memory, okay? So there are fields in each student's record, and one of these fields is the student's perm number. If I want to find the name of a particular student with a given perm number, I don't need to know where in memory the data for that student is stored. I just provide a key say, okay, this is the perm number I'm looking for. Of course, this field is too small for perm number. It does one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bits. But let's imagine that it's wider. So the perm number is placed in this comparand register. 
And the mask says basically, in doing comparisons, ignore these parts. I'm only interested in the perm number. And then the hardware of the associated memory basically in parallel compares this key in the unmasked part to everything that is stored in memory and then says, okay, here is a record in the memory that matches that search. Okay? So with one operation of the content addressable memory or searching memory, I locate the data that I want. So here is a brief history of how these uh, content addressable memories developed and how eventually they were generalized to associative processors, meaning that it wasn't just retrieval of data from memory, but some, some kinds of processing can also be done in parallel on contents of uh, memory words. Okay, if you remember in the first lecture, I talked about uh, uh, the Flynn Johnson classification. Uh, Flynn divided uh, architectures into four categories of SysD, SIMD, MIMD, and MISD. And Johnson divided MIMD into four categories, global memory shared variable, global memory message passing, distributed memory message passing, and distributed memory shared variable. And uh, I mentioned that this category is rarely used. And similarly, MISD in the original Flynn classification is rarely used. But here's an example of a MISTI architecture. Okay, so there's a single data stream being processed. Data comes in, it's subjected to some processing here. And these three blocks do something different things than that data. And then the result of those three blocks are combined by this block. So there's one data stream coming in. But each of these boxes has its own instruction stream uh, doing some kind of processing on the data. So it runs a program, let's say. So instruction stream one, stream two, stream three, stream four, stream five. Five instruction stream operating on one data stream. Okay, there has been an ongoing debate uh, since several decades ago about uh, the relative merits of SIMD parallel processing versus MIMD. So I've shown a timeline for SIMD here, one of the first uh, architectures in this category. The first significant architecture was ILIAC-4, developed at the University of Illinois. Then the distributed array processor, then the Goodyear massively parallel processor, uh, Thinking Machine Corporation CM2, and MassPars, MassPars is the name of a company, MP1, and more recently, Clear Speed Array Processor. These are sort of important systems in this category. Now, the nice thing about SIMD is that the processors are sort of bare-bone processors. They have just maybe an ALU. They don't have uh, sophisticated control, instruction fetch, instruction decoding, things like branch prediction. All these things are done centrally. And then the processors are sort of just uh, laborer that are told what operation to execute, and they just execute. So they don't have any sophisticated decision-making capability. And therefore, you can afford to have a larger number of processors of this kind. The downside of SIMD is that broadcasting instructions from that central unit that fetches and interprets instructions to all the large number of processors is non-trivial and uh, involves overhead. Uh, furthermore, if these processors are operating synchronously, that means that the slowest processor dictates 
So for example, if the processors are doing, let's say, division. So the main control unit says perform division of the contents of register one by register two. Okay, so all the processors follow this instruction. Some of them may be done more quickly depending on the operands involved, but they all have to wait for the slowest one to finish before the next instruction can be issued. So this debate is still ongoing. For some applications, SIMD is a good fit and leads to better efficiency. For many applications, more applications, MIMD is a better fit. And there's also a compromise between these two, which is known as SPIMD, SPMD. So instead of single instruction, multiple data, uh, we have single program multiple data. In other words, the processors are running identical programs, but they are not synchronized with each other. So they're allowed to sort of go faster if uh, the data they're processing is such that the faster speed is possible. Then once in a while we have to synchronize them uh, in order to allow them to coordinate in their uh, combining the results of their uh, computations. Okay, the next debate is global versus distributed memory. When you have global memory, as shown here, we have a bunch of processors, a bunch of memory modules. Okay, the memory when it's large, it's rarely just one, you know, one chunk of memory, one block, but it's divided into modules, sometimes called memory banks. And then you need a processor to memory network for the processors to be able to access memory modules and fetch data. And this processor to memory network can be as simple as just a bus, a simple bus. So all the processors are connected to this common bus, all the memory modules are connected. But that bus is likely to become a bottleneck because of many processors are trying to access many memory modules, a lot of traffic, memory traffic is generated and a single bus may not have the bandwidth to basically carry this out. Sometimes we can use multiple buses so that as processor zero is accessing, let's say memory module one over one bus, processor one can access memory module 10 maybe on another bus. So some concurrency uh, is allowed. There's also sometimes a processor to processor network that allows processors to directly communicate with each other without having to go through memory, therefore sort of relieving this, this network from additional traffic. This, for example, can be used for interrupt. One processor can interrupt another processor uh, through this network rather than having to go through memory. And then the parallel I.O. capability is also provided here so that uh, processors can access I.O. devices or memory modules can supply data to output devices or receive data from input devices. So this processor to memory network is really the heart of the system. Processors are just conventional processors. We can buy chips that are already on the market and use them here. And memory banks are, again, ready-made chips that we can use. And this part, the design of this part, uh, basically affects how well the system works as a parallel processor. Okay, in order to reduce uh, the traffic between processors and memory modules and therefore sort of uh, relieve, uh, relieve this network from having to send back and forth requests and data, we can provide caches next to the processors. So there are multiple caches. And then the data that this processor accesses frequently is kept in this cache, therefore it doesn't have to go to memory for every piece of data. 
Therefore, traffic through this processor to memory network is reduced. However, the challenge here is that if the data is shared so that processor 0 and processor 1 both want to access the same data, then keeping these two copies of the same data consistent, so if this one writes into that data, okay, the copy in the other processor becomes stale or out of date, and therefore we need schemes. These are collectively known as cache coherence schemes to make sure the data remains consistent. So we solve one problem, reduce traffic through this network, but we created another problem maintaining cache coherence. However, at least in the case where data is not shared, in other words, some piece of data is brought into this cache, and it's only in that cache, okay, not in the other caches, then this can lead to much improved performance uh, by reducing traffic through the processor to memory network. Okay, in distributed shared memory, memory is not a global resource, but is divided between the processors. So each processor has a chunk of memory connected to it, and then the processors can communicate with each other through an interconnection network. And here I've shown each processor has three ports into this network. Okay. So if a processor wants to access data that is it, uh, in its own private memory, it does so directly. If it wants data that is somewhere else, of course we should have a, some sort of directory that tells it where the data is. It sends a request to another processor, asks for that data, and then continues its work. Sometimes if that data is something that this processor has a long-term interest in, instead of just accessing that data, maybe that data basically is relocated from its current location and is placed here so that from now on processor zero can access it more efficiently. So sometimes we have data relocation rather than just access to one piece of data. So this is an example of a non-uniform memory access architecture. It's non-uniform because processor zero can access this piece of memory rather quickly. But if it wants to access this piece, it takes longer because it has to go through the network. And often it is the case that it's easier to access one processor compared to another one. Therefore, this is very fast. This is slower maybe this access is much slower depending on the structure of this network. So it's non-uniform memory access as opposed to uniform memory access that we had in the previous. So no matter where in memory you want to access, things have to go through this processor to memory network and it has a particular fixed latency. Of course, there are sometimes conflicts that add to that latency. But beyond that, every piece of data is just as easily accessible. Okay? Or you can say access is just as difficult because it may take a long time. But there's uniformity in access. Here is non-uniform. OK, I, I leave the description of PRAM to the beginning of the next lecture. Uh, not next lecture, when we talk about shared memory model. OK, so uh, for now, uh, let's leave this. Uh. OK, distributed memory architectures are characterized by graphs. And this is basically the diagram and the cover of my textbook. And it sort of conveys what we in parallel processing have come to know as the sea of interconnection network. There are so many different interconnection networks proposed over time that we liken this to a sea. And we as architects or users of these architectures are really baffled by the variety of networks, which one to choose, which one is better for a particular type of application.
So this is the C of interconnection network, meaning that there are very many of these uh, networks and choosing between them is a non-trivial task. So these are some interconnection network. Uh, this is sort of a reference table. I'm not going to describe everything that is here. Uh, One-dimensional mesh or linear array, uh, one-dimensional torus, which is ring, 2D mesh and torus, 3D mesh, pyramid, binary tree, 4 array hyper tree. Some of these we'll see later in more detail. So just, just to give you an idea of the variety of these architectures, and the number of nodes in each one as a function of one or more parameters that we can set, the network diameter, again, as a function of those parameters, bisection width, node degree, and whether the network can be constructed by local or short links, which is the case in the first few for the first few architectures, and the other ones, you cannot build them with short links. Now, the significance of short links is that if your links are short, that means communication between processors will be fast because signal propagation delay on short links and also the amount of power that you have to use to communicate on short links is much less than otherwise. Okay, so here's an example of a hierarchical bus system. Uh, I mentioned that if you use a single bus, that's likely to become a bottleneck because a lot of traffic goes through it. Hierarchical buses solve that problem by providing multiple levels of buses. So when processors in this cluster want to communicate with each other, they use this shared bus within the cluster. So local communication within clusters uses use the private bus of cluster, and therefore they do not interfere with each other. Now, if this cluster wants to communicate with this one, then it has to go through the bus switch to this higher level bus. So that takes longer and also uses this shared resource which means that if a processor in this cluster is communicating with this one, then another processor in this cluster cannot simultaneously communicate with that one because it's shared resource. There's a conflict there, okay? So as long as uh, communication between processors uh, is mostly local within clusters, then this is a good architecture. You still have the ability to communicate long distance from a processor in this cluster, let's say, through bus switches to this cluster, if needed. We try to minimize those long distance communications, but we do have the ability to, to use those. Okay, so this is uh, the modern data center, which is basically a very large supercomputer. Uh, optimized for the particular task of that data center, whether it is Google or Amazon, looks like this. There are very many processors, and these processors are basically organized into clusters of processors. And nowadays, they are within a container. So each of these containers, you can imagine like the a cargo part of a semi-truck, it's huge. So inside this is like a computer room, you can walk in it, and there are servers on both sides. And each of these is connected to power and also to, um, if it's water cooled, to water supply so that it can be cooled with water. Okay, so power and water distribution goes through these. And the nice thing about this, this is highly modular. If uh, one of these is sort of fails or it's not performing uh, up to par, it can be moved uh, and a new one 
put in place while that one is being repaired or and if you want to upgrade your servers well you upgrade you know some of them and gradually you know do the upgrade for all the other uh, uh, containers so this particular container in this example has 2500 servers in it so you can calculate you know counting the number of containers you get how many servers are in this data center so two of the challenges of modern data center is providing the power you need a lot of power so these are typically built in locations where power is readily available and is also cheap because they use a lot of power and also water they're typically built near rivers or lakes where water is plentiful and you can use it for cooling okay uh, and nowadays when we build a, a chip it used to be that you know we counted the complexity of the chip in terms of how many gates there were on it or how many transistors nowadays interconnects uh, are also very important both in terms of the area they occupy on the chip and on signal delay that they cause and this diagram from an old paper uh, of mine shows that if you connect uh, processors into 2d mesh because you can have pretty short wires connecting them then the wire delay in nanoseconds is pretty small because the wire length is small if you go to 2d torus the wire length increases a little bit and if you go to hypercube you have much longer wires and therefore communication delay between the nodes become a major factor to deal with in building high performance systems uh, this is the last diagram that I show you. Uh, it's a cartoon that uh, shows the pitfalls of scaling up. Now, in the science fiction films, you may have seen, for example, some creature like an ant that for some reason has grown very big, uh, say 10 to the 4 times the size of an actual ant. It just go, goes... Uh, on the streets and destroys building and kills people and so on the thing is the ant scaled up a factor 10 to the 4 is really impractical the same applies to you know if you have a 4x4 four four mesh scaling up scaling it up to a much larger mesh creates a lot of problems and the same thing here and the reason that you can't have a creature that looks like this is 10 to the 4 times a regular ant is this you know when you scale up the ant you know linear scaling by factor 10 to the 4 the weight of the ant grows by a factor 10 to the 12 like a cube of this and in order to bear that large weight the thickness of the arms or legs uh, must be quite large so uh, for this example the leg thickness must grow from 0.1 millimeter which is what we have for a real ant roughly to 100 meter so the ant that has grown by a factor of 10 to the 4 let's say from 5 millimeters to 50 meters so the end is 50 meters in length okay the leg thickness must be 100 meter even larger than the size of the end so it's infeasible to scale up the end while still looking like an end in fact if you look at the animal kingdom heavier animals look very different than very light animals so elephants for example have very thick legs whereas horses have pretty slim legs so that that's the pitfall of scalability you cannot scale up the same architecture 
okay without changing some properties some elements of the architecture you can't just say okay i'm going to build this architecture at 100 times the size because you have to sort of take care of this these issues of scalability all right so that concludes my lecture three uh, until next time uh, lecture four please stay safe and i'll see you soon